Uh, welcome to all of our attendees. Thank you for joining us for this panel presented by Folk Alliance International for Folk Unlocked. Uh, to begin, we recognize the, complex the complexity and privilege of gathering online today by sharing a digital land acknowledgement written by Adrian Wong of Spider Web Show in Ontario and adapted for this webinar. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let us take a moment to acknowledge the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not readily available in many indigenous and marginalized communities. We invite you to join in acknowledging our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and active allyship. Uh, we hope that you will share your thoughts and observations in the Folk Unlocked chat box. This panel will be available for viewing uh, for the remainder of the conference once it is air aired at its scheduled time. Uh, this panel will be followed by a live breakout session of continuing the conversation, space for those who have previously participated in the program to activate their, com their commitment to social change and hold each other accountable. For those of you who have not yet participated in committing to conversation, uh, we invite you to join us in an upcoming session by completing the statement of intent, uh, the link to which can be found in the chat box. So uh, our staff will be posting that, uh, posting those links actively now. So um, a little context about how this panel came to be before we introduce our guests and uh, let the conversation take its course. In June, 2020, Lily Lewis contacted FAI to propose a program called Committing to Conversation, a series of small scale facilitated conversations about race, cultural equity, and social justice between willing participants with a long-term goal of normalizing conversations about systemic racism within our folk music community, fostering a culture of communication across a spectrum of experience and engaging members in the work of active allyship. Since then, close to 75 people have participated in 13 gatherings with conversations being as impactful as they were varied. Each of the committing to conversation facilitators, Lily Lewis, Janice Jo Lee, and Saul Paul have led multiple groups in unearthing their own implicit bias and their role in shifting the culture in our folk communities. Um, it is my is it, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome them to share their insights with the folk unlocked community today. So uh, hi folks, um, my name is Fawn. And uh, before we introduce our panelists, uh, I'm gonna say a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a part of the Folk Alliance International team. I'm our digital media coordinator. So a lot of the graphics that you see, I probably designed, but outside of my Folk Alliance uh, work, um, I'm a, a, an LGBTQIA community um, advocate. And I do a lot of work with the transgender and gender nonconforming communities. My pronouns are they, them. And I'm on the board of Blackout, a nonprofit uh, here in uh, Kansas City in the Midwest uh, that focuses on supporting uh, Black, uh, gay, and queer communities who um, are HIV positive. Uh, I'm also on the board of the Midwest Rainbow Research Institute, which is a nonprofit that's focused on um, changing public institutions and corporations, uh, ensuring that their policies are LGBTQ uh, friendly. And so a lot of my work uh, consists of consulting uh, and moderating uh, discussions based on uh, queer identities, uh, racial and ethnic identities, and how those intersect with socioeconomic issues. Um, I've been a part of a couple of our Committing to Conversation uh, sessions, and I've always stepped away amazed and learning way more than uh, I can put in to those conversations. So I'm really proud to uh, facilitate this discussion among our facilitators. So uh, this conversation will follow a very loose outline today, which you can see in the slide on the screen right now. Um, so let's start at the beginning and uh, start with you, Lily. Can you explain a little bit about why uh, you approached Folk Alliance International with this idea and what you had in mind for this program? Sure, well, um, I, I consider, like, I really think that Folk Alliance asked for this um and they they started asking for it when they decided to bring um folk alliance to new orleans um there was quite a bit of prep work in bringing folk alliance to new orleans it had never been there um, new orleans had a larger community of color than 
um, you know, than a lot of the cities that uh, Folk Alliance has participated in. And we in New Orleans were told that they were come that that FAI was coming to New or New Orleans deliberately um, because, you know, um, the space had not been all that welcoming for people of color and particularly for black Americans. Um, and, you know, and over the course of years, you know, we had sort of been uninvited from the conference in kind of subtle ways. And, you know, between the literature that's on the Folk Alliance website and the gathering of New Orleans uh, music community leaders um, that we, we had sort of in May, Prior to uh, Folk Alliance coming to New Orleans, it was it was made clear like we're aware of this issue in our community. We want to rectify it. Um, we want to do it like we do everything else from the ground up, um, and 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 let's be deliberate about it. And they they asked for help. They asked for help. Um, so uh, we had a really amazing conference in February. Uh, Sorry, I guess that was January this time. And um, and I got a lot of feedback from my community here as the conference was leaving. And then all of a sudden the world changed. Um, and I'd seen what an amazing job FAI had done in reaching out to the community to sort of address the ways in which our community was dealing with uh, the virus and quarantine and, and our industry changing and everybody being sort of, you know, everything being up in the air. And all of a sudden we have this incredibly, you know, traumatic moment, like a collectively traumatic moment with the George Floyd murder. Um, and, uh, and there was a window uh, of awareness, broader awareness, broader urgency, and I thought, why not use the tools that FAI already had done, had had employed to engage the community? Use it, use it for this, like help the community face this moment, this cultural moment, um, in a uh, ideally uh, responsible manner. Um, ha like help help us, this community, show up for each other and meet this moment in a responsible manner and use it as an opportunity for growth. Really just wanted to take advantage of the tools that, that Folk Alliance already had implemented. And I'm thrilled that um, that they said yes. There was no hesitation whatsoever. Um, and the vision was always to, uh, to emphasize intimacy, to mm. emphasize humanity, to emphasize person-to-person -person interaction, um, to emphasize vulnerability. Um, my my personal goal, and, and maybe my other facilitators had a different point of view, but my personal goal um, was more about um, uh, cultivating patience, um, cultivating um, leaning into feeling uncomfortable, um, cultivating kind of realness. I didn't necessarily feel like I wanted to go in as a teacher or a lecturer. I wanted to go in as a facilitator. I wanted to hold space and I wanted to then impose um, where I felt necessary or maybe offer, maybe impose is too strong of a word, offer a different view when I felt it could be of service, um, you know, cause we all are responsible for growing each other up. And that's all I wanted to do, create little small spaces where we could practice growing each other up. Mm. Thank you, Lily. Um, I'd love to bring Saul Paul into the conversation now um, so, Paul, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a bit about your reasons for agreeing to be a facilitator to committing to conversation? Um, one, the work is necessary. Two, um, I'm a fan mm -hmm. of Folk Alliance. I love that um, when they reached out, it wasn't in response to, it wasn't just a reaction to what had been happen, happening uh, mm -hmm. currently in the culture. Um, I like to highlight that around the time George Floyd died, or literally when George Floyd was murdered, uh, many organizations um, in reaction to that sent out letters and said, hey, we're going to do this, or we stand with lives of Black people and Black Lives Matter and whatnot. And uh, it just felt empty. If nothing else, the timing was poor because it, it seemed more reactionary. And with Folk Alliance, um, this was just ongoing. Uh, I had the opportunity earlier in the year. 
uh, when, when the, at the Folk Alliance um, in January in New Orleans to, to speak on a panel about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, as well as be one of the um, facilitators for the affinity groups. So it, it just felt authentic because it was a continuation of the work they had been doing. So that's why it was an easy yes. Uh, plus it was in my, uh, my wheelhouse, right? I'd already been working on um, anti-racism work. And so uh, to be able to, to, to play a part in um, the next generation of leaders or to play a part in Folk Alliance, um, allowing their community to become more diverse, more equitable and more inclusive. Now me, I always like to highlight for the asterisk on that, those are all $5 words. If you say those words out in public, you get bonus points because then people will say, oh, ooh, yeah, diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, so that's why uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm jaded toward it. So to be able to play part in building something from the ground up, uh, as you mentioned, right, like these, these people that opted in, chose to lean into this work, who came at it with the open mind, who were curated, not that anybody was blocked out, but people had to opt in and, and share their why. I just thought that was a great opportunity to play part uh, in creating the future. Thank you, Saul Paul. That is so, I resonate with that so much. And my own experience is just, you know, with um, reactive uh, activism rather mm. than, uh, or if you can call that activism, um, <laughs> rather than like proactive uh, activism. So thank you. Sorry, a, a recent friend of mine uh, shared a word and it really struck, struck uh, stood out to me, performatory mm. activism. Oh, uh, I like yeah, that, performatory like, oh, activism. Yeah, that's what it is. It's like, let's mm. make it appear. Uh, but I really saw this. Uh, I know folk, folk alliance had, um, and it's key, right? Like, like for a person, for, um, for anyone, it starts with awareness to know where you are as well as know where you want to go. And since I've been a part of folk alliance, like there hasn't been like, they, they get like, Hey, we're kind of white. Hey, we're kind of, um, like th there's a generational gap here. Like they, they, they saw what they were but they knew what they wanted to be and, and committed to, uh, to doing the work. So that's that out. That's top notch. Respect. Nice. Thank you, Saul Paul. Um, maybe now's a good time to hear from Janice Jolie um, on her experience facilitating uh, committing to conversation. Janice, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us more about your approach to leading these conversations? Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm just so honored to be part of the conversation. Um, I think I come from I come from a Canadian perspective. I'm in uh, Toronto, Canada, and you know we're talking about right. these five dollar words, Saul Paul, diversity. In Canada, we have multiculturalism. That's our favorite word, and I grew up with that concept of ca Canada being multicultural. Mm -hmm. But what the actual lived experience of that is, it's it's pockets of all these different communities existing together, but not in community, not um, there weren't bridges between the communities and there being racism between all the communities, right? And so really what we, you know, multiculturalism allows us to be in the room together and like tolerate each other or ignore each other, um, but we could still have all kinds of racist ideas and practices. So what I was interested in is anti-racism and actually addressing white supremacy, right? And when, it, when I went to Folk Alliance, same thing, like I'm an East Asian light-skinned, person. So in a lot of ways, you know, university educated English speaking, I can like kind of be a white person and succeed the, the the more I perform my whiteness. And coming to Folk Alliance is really interesting knowing that there's blues music here, there's roots, there's country, and there's we're all playing black music and there's not there there are not many black people at all. Right. And so as you were saying like that awareness of that um is why I, um, when Folk Alliance went to New Orleans in January 2020, I made it a project for us in Canada to present a room of all BIPOC, as we say, Black, Indigenous, Persons of Color artists and LGBTQ artists. And the room was called Poets, Queers, and Radicals. And I wanted that space to be a celebratory space where we could really um, kind of try and decolonize 
one room at Folk Alliance. So the, my approach to the conversation and committing to conversation is similar to Lily, like, and, and Saul, like we, Saul Paul, we are facilitating, right? Everyone's coming with their own experience, with so many perspectives, that's, and we can learn so much from listening to each other. And really what our role is, is to create a space where people feel comfortable enough to be vulnerable and to um, allow space for compassion. And everybody who was coming to committing to conversation was ready to have that conversation, right? They have consented to be in that space. So it makes other it makes our role a little easier. Um, but in general, the 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 tool that I was trying to um, I suppose pass was the listening aspect. Because it's so hard to want to listen to someone who you think has the wrong views. Right, it's so hard to want to listen to someone who is saying racist things at you, but actually, our role is to try and build a bridge or build a relationship with this person uh, built on trust and time, and as you know, we know conversation. So that was an interesting thing to to focus on, um, and I think it surprised me and others. It's like, oh, this is actually about compassion and listening, you know. Good stuff. Um, what are some uh, some things that maybe uh, Lily or Saul Paul um, have said that have caused a like a spark of curiosity mm -hmm. for you? You know, I think one of the things that stands out to me is always the generosity of Black people to want to be able to continue coming back to this conversation when there's so much ignorance, like the. Uh, there's so much grace in Lily presenting, you know, asking Folk Alliance to do it, right? And that to me is uh, really heartening uh, because there's always constantly so much harm. Like there was racism. We did experience racism in our room um, at Folk Alliance, right? But to always come back, to come back even as people make mistakes. And the, the model of the circle way that we were using, Lily, of, you know, what the person who said, whatever the person before you just said to actively listen and kind of repeat or connect what you're going to say to what they said. That's a beautiful way to build bridges. Right. And that kind of generosity and grace, I think is, was something that really was helpful in our conversation, you know? Um, Janice, you actually bring up something really, um, really important, the circle way. Um, and I think that now it might be a good segue uh, to sort of like loosen up, the conversation um, and have more of a, a back and forth sort of uh, structure. Um, the next topic on the agenda is tools, observations, and impacts. Um, I was wondering if anyone wanted to start by sharing some of the tools that you've used to anchor these conversations. But Janice, you brought up the circle way. Do you do you mind starting us off and talking about what that what that is and what that means? Yeah, it was given to all the participants of the conversation, and it's Lily's model, which is. Um, you know, we take turns speaking, but when it's your turn to speak and you have an item, you like hold an item when it's your turn to speak. And uh, that was also a fun way to connect with people to see what they had. Um, it, it made us in the group actively practice listening, right? And so that the, the, the group becomes a, um, a learning zone where you, you practice this act of listening, where you repeat what someone has just said to make sure you understand it in the way they wanted you to understand it. And so then when we come out of the workshop or out of the conversation and um, you're doing that kind of work, let's say in the real world, you've practiced it before, right? In the circle way. And I find that kind of practical transfer of skills really helpful. I, I think, um... The one thing that I would add to that, like the thing that has made circling um, and there's and there are kind of two different traditions that we were borrowing from. There is a cir the circle way, which is borrowed from indigenous communities. And then there's also this sort of like new AD, like circling um, practice um, that I learned from a bunch of the personal growth and development folks out in uh, Boulder um, and um, and integrative work. And in with that little, the detail that that 
practice adds is that it says, it's not just, did I understand what you said the way you meant me to understand it? But it is also to acknowledge what comes up for me when I hear your words. So it's to say, you know, when you say that, I notice in myself. So it's like somebody might say something that I experience as racist and they think they're being sweet, you know. I can say then, you know, when in hearing that, that which you just said, let's use a generic example. For example, in hearing that you just said that I was articulate. I noticed in myself that I got a little tight, that my stomach went funny, that I, you know, I my head went a little bit numb. And I noticed that I have different associations with that word being used um, in this context than you might have anticipated. And I don't know, but I just, I noticed that I had a negative response, even though, you know, I can acknowledge that may not be where you were coming from. You know, that kind of thing of like allowing room for my response if I'm, feeling, you know, if I'm feeling defensive or edgy or uncomfortable, um, no matter what side of the fence we're on, we all have permission to own our own experience and say, hey, I noticed that when you said that, I got triggered or that that felt a little rough for me and let me report on that. Or I noticed that when you said that, I felt a sense of relief or I felt a sense of um, curiosity. Like we had one circumstance where where the the drill down ended up like being that you don't have to be racist to have racist beliefs or to say racist things um and like and i i noticed that the energy shift shifted in the room when that was said and and the sort of like oh and hearing that i noticed like one of the participants said something to the effect of like i noticed that that I, I feel surprised in, in acknowledging that detail, that I can say and think racist things. I can, I can even generate experiences of racism for the person on the, what I call the other side, um, without, without myself um, trying to cause harm, you know? And like, that requires a pause, you know, that you can cause harm without trying to. You know, I think um, in the in the world of developing allyship and hopefully what I want to get to is fellowship, um, that piece of acknowledgement, acknowledging that you can cause harm without trying to, I think is like absolutely fundamental and it's very, very difficult to let it land. Um, but I think in allowing people to report um, their discomfort or their, um, their, their moments of aha, like on the side, on the other side of what someone has said, that that's a practice that has deeply enhanced my life across the board. And it sounds corny at first when you first do it, but like, try it in a relationship, like try it, like, you know, with somebody you're struggling with, you know what, when you said that, I noticed that I responded in this way on the inside. I may not have said it out loud, but what I felt inside was blah. Try that. You know, it's um, it's uh, it of course also borrows from the nonviolent communication community because you're using I language and you know you're bringing it back to you. Nobody really can dispute your direct experience. Nobody can say you didn't feel that way. You know, they you know, and if they did, well then they're their neurosis is revealing itself and you're not busy telling them what they meant. You're busy saying what it meant to you. And I think uh, like us flexing that muscle, um, being, being transparent about what things mean to us and then the other muscle of being able to receive that information, um, that's, that's really the muscles that I'm trying to train up in these rooms that I'm hoping that we can all train up um, in these rooms. Like, we have to diffuse, I, you know, it's tough to use have to language. It's tough, can't you should, it's a, that's an aggressive word, right? But in my heart of hearts, I want us to diffuse the charge between us, even when we get charged inside. Like I, I am a middle-aged black lesbian of size. I feel like I have a lot of things to get charged about. And at the same time, 
What I want to generate is peace in my communities. What I want to generate is functionality. I want us to move forward. I want us to build a better world and solve the problems that we, the bigger problems, we will not survive if we don't work this stuff out. You know what I mean? And so it's really important um, for, for us to massage these muscles that are tight and dense and, um, and build bridges, you know, build these bridges by any means necessary. Mm. Thank you for putting that so beautifully. Wow. Um, and I think that speaks so much to just how important the, you know, the delicacy of language is and framing these like incredibly painful and complex and really like knotted up uh, topics and sort of like unwinding that in, in the moment is such a is such a really powerful thing. Um, I wanna to get to Saul Paul, but Janice, Jolie, I know that you have um, like a relevant, some relevant, um, maybe a visual aid or a slide. Would, would you mind if we went to that real quick? Do you mind explaining uh, what, we're, what, we're, what we're looking at here? That's perfect, because Lily is talking about building a bridge yeah. and diffusing. And this is a diagram I was showing in the in the conversations, there's three of them. And this is kind of to explain why we are, there's a gulf between us, right? So if our neighbor on the left, we're saying that they're a racist, right? And we're just kind of antagonizing each other and there's this gulf between us. But we, what we need to do is understand why there's the gulf between us. So there's, the, there's anger, pain, and grief. And so if we really wanna understand it, you know, we have to actually listen and learn that person's story. And we're well poised to do this as folk musicians. That's how we connect, is we connect through storytelling, right? So my neighbor, maybe they grew up in a monoculture. Maybe they were born into wealth, property, and privilege. Uh, and there's a specific set of stories they have been told their whole life that, uh, that makes them up to being having the values that they have. On my side, on the right here, my ex life experience is probably different. Maybe I grew up with diverse friends. Maybe I had the privilege of education and travel to be able to meet different people, build relationships and be able to love people who are different than me. And I've grown up with a very specific set of stories that I've been told my whole life about the world, right? So there, the, the gulf between us is misunderstanding, stubbornness, like being unwilling to diffuse, right? Not consenting to diffuse, uh, a lack of compassion and impatience. And to me, impatience is, if you scratch the surface of impatience, it's it's anger. And what it, this gulf between us is like, what, um, how I want the world to be and how it is, right? And so the work is to reconcile that. And to reconcile that is through conversation and by understanding the other person's story, right? So we got to build a bridge. And it takes on, on all sides humility the ability to acknowledge that maybe you were mistaken. And oftentimes it's because we're ignorant, which is oftentimes not our fault that we didn't have access to that information. And so us as storytellers, as educators, want to offer that information in a way that can be received, right? Um, and it takes love, it takes courage. And I love the word courage because it comes from ka, right? From heart power. Um, and on our side, we need to have commitment which I love that the conversations were called committing to conversation because it takes a long time. It's not going to happen in one conversation. It might happen in five to eight to 20 conversations over five to 10 years, right? Um, and we often get so dejected when the first conversation doesn't go well because we need commitment. We need support. You can't do it by yourself. You will burn yourself out. And you need resources, right? Whether those are stories, books, time, literal food, and, and care. And you take a lot of time to then build this, this bridge between you. And through listening, building trust, you build friendship. And so one at a time, we build these bridges. Um, and that's truly the work, right? So I, I really liked sharing this because it, it helped kind of um, break down and help us understand what our actual strategy needs to be. And the strategy to antagonize people is actually really ineffective, as self-righteous and unsatisfying it might feel. Um, and the anger is so necessary to feel and validate the anger at the way of the, of the world. But once we move through our anger and have um, com capacity for compassion, capacity to commit a lot of time, I find that really the work is to build relationship. 
Um, so, Paul, I want to I want to hear from you. What are some tools that you use during these uh, during these conversations? So, Paul, I think you're you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Um, yeah, I didn't say much. I spent half that time just thinking. I think I came. What I came up with was uh, heart. Being able to create a, a safe space. Um, something that um, both the other fellow panelists mentioned, and I really saw it as powerful. Like, right when you lead with heart, when you create the safe space, it allowed people um, to become vulnerable and to deal with their stuff. Uh, let those walls down, and, and let those walls down, and really be present, and to really. Um, I think what I noticed in the the, the groups that we had, the, the folks that were present. Um, for the most part, uh, they were white and they came at, it was very eye opening to me because as they were candid about what they deal with in their own communities, right? Because it wasn't about like, uh, I came to facilitate and we had these people speak uh, or everybody got to share and it wasn't like listen to me, it was more like everybody's voice was valuable and everybody spoke. And what I've discovered is that when people wanna change, um, the hardest part seems to be their family and friends and their personal community, because uh, that racism that people that, that, that you know that makes the news that you hear about often, the microaggressions that take place all the time that you see, um, it has to get to a head before it becomes this public thing. But when that uh, when there's not mixed company, when it's just them amongst their family and their friends, them being different, them wanting to be the change and create this new uh, this new world the challenge becomes uh, them being bold enough to, um, uh, to stand out and be different. Because, it, I mean, I, I, I don't think my joke, if I, if I can really get it, I'm like, wow, that's a lot of crazy conversations happening when I'm not around, apparently. Like when white people are amongst white people. Because what people say their grandparents say, what their parents say, what their best friend that they grew up with is what they say. They're like, people cried in our circles. When they got real, they're just like, this is crazy, man. Like to think my my people, my friends think like this. Um, and so one of the so, so one, it was like lead with heart so people could feel safe, become vulnerable, be amongst other people that share that same uh heart. Um, and then the other tool, one of the tools that we use is um this acronym change, right? Because racism comes in in many forms and fashions, but you can lump it into like three major categories. Um intrapersonal, which is like racism that's internal um like the way you see things the way you view things um and then there's interpersonal racism which is what we're probably the most popular like somebody said something did something to someone it's overtly racist we see it and then there's systemic and institutional racism and that's systems and institutions uh and when it all comes together with me i'm personally passionate about personal responsibility and that starts with self and so i always challenge people to to be the change and we use this here, which very briefly is like, you choose to be the change, right? Like it starts with that, like it goes back to that self-awareness. Uh, and then you decide where you can help um, because it can become overwhelming. Once your eyes become open and you realize how unjust uh, the world actually is, how racism is everywhere, how this is, it's just bad, it becomes overwhelming, but you really have to accept like where you can be the change at, right? So you choose to do it. Uh, and then you decide to help and then you accept what you can't change and you notice when you can make a change and then you go and you do it. Um, and then as you do it, you empower other people. That way it doesn't also, like I'm, I'm big on the self-care piece as well. Like it's not on you. Like there's no hero complex necessary. You don't have to be the hero. Uh, you just be the change in the world that you live in, right? So as you go and you do it and you empower others and you bring others along with you, that's where the sustainability comes from. So now it's not on you to do it all because you've empowered others to do the work as well. And so uh, many people found uh, that tool necessary, the acronym CHANGE. Um, and what you see there is not a proprietary tool, but so many people that had the heart were not familiar with uh, anti-racism anti work, like what it meant to become an anti-racist. So this right here was very popular um, as we facilitated our groups, uh, so you should Google it, look it up on how to become an anti-racist. 
um, because you don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to be uh, become super educated. Like you just have to become a good person, become a better person, right? And there are fancy words that go along with them, this and that, but really, uh, I love it. As, uh, us as troubadours, us as educators and teachers and those that sing and create, that's what we do. We, we move people, we touch people's heart. And especially for the folk community, to become an anti-racist, um, it's not hard work. You don't need to go get another degree. Uh, you just decide to become intentional. And along the way, you'll find the tools that best fit you. That That's so powerful. And um, I, I want to touch on just one thing that you said, um, the, uh, the change acronym. And I think that this connects to a lot of what you're saying, and it goes back to what you were what you mentioned about uh, the, the five dollar words and how using some words, you know, gets you more bonus points in uh, certain circles or environments. Um, and I really, I, I think that that's uh, really linked to this um, corporatization of uh, social justice and equity, and trying to um, create this jargon that turns this into. Um, an educational issue, and it is an educational issue. But when I when I look at Janice, your diagrams, and when I look at Saul, your change acronym, this is really simple stuff. It's like words that people use on a daily basis. It's feelings that people already have, and it's reframing that in such like an accessible way. Um, I I feel like sometimes the 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 language that is sort of like uh, the, the $5 words that Saul Paul mentioned earlier, that that can maybe like intimidate some people from really like joining in in the conversation because they maybe don't know what that means or, they, um, or they're unfamiliar with it or they think it means something that it doesn't mean. Uh, do, do any of you have thoughts on, on that and like how important the, the language that you use is in the work that you do on, on that like specific level? I... I I would like to start out by saying, like, I have a personal pet peeve about the emphasis on language, on buzzwords, on um, because what I find is that people are using this language to be performative. People are using this language to say, see, I know what the issues are. I know what's going on. And they're actually putting the language out front um, and using that as another defense mechanism. Um, we all have defense mechanisms and we all use whatever tools we have at our disposal to survive in this world. And so I, I'm not trying to place judgment here, but I am, um, I do want to put out a word of caution because I think we can all, we can all do that. We can all find ourselves you know, front loading the right language and still miss the person that we're talking yeah. to. Um, if we, if we, if we forget that this is, this is really about lives. And I think one of the things we learned in 2020 and in going through a pandemic together is that, is that lives, uh, you know, like this life thing is really fragile. You know, our bodies are vulnerable. Um, and we, when we don't have access to justice, it is life threatening. Mm. When we don't, you know, we use the word equity. Um, you know, like I get, I get targeted a lot for um, being, you know, uh, engaging in identity politics, as it were. But I, I, I don't consider my body and my being and my well-being and the well-being of my family political. You know, I and. And, and I don't consider any of the things that I am, the intersections that I live in, um, just about identity. You know, I consider this to be dignity politics. I consider, uh, I, I believe that the language that I uh, aspire to focus on um, uh, will put everyone's dignity out front. I find um, from the world of trauma work um, that at the end of the day, uh, people will do anything to protect their dignity. I think that's one of the things that's uh, in in that water, in that moat between us that we're trying to build a bridge over. One of the things that's there um, is this this really um, deep kind of brainstem level 
um, desire to protect our dignity because a lot of people have been pulverized by the walk that they're living, you know, um, and a lot of our defensiveness is like, I don't feel like I don't always have anything left except my dignity. And so I, I'll mount up and I'll soldier up and I have to be right because I can't surrender that, you know, and we get, we learn that we can't surrender that when, when all kinds of circumstances are putting that under threat at any given moment. So I, I just, I just want to remember that. Like, I, I do think it's super essential to use language that's relatable, that feels like, uh, I got that right away. And sometimes my woo woo hippie talk does not do the trick. I understand that. But, um, um, but the, the idea is to drill, for me, I like the idea of drill around, drilling around on language, like to see what language works in the room, to see what, because I don't, I don't want to front load too many buzzwords, I don't, and I don't want anybody to leave my room thinking, oh, she gave me all the right words to say, mm-hmm. you know, so now I'm woke, you know, it's like, nope, that's not the thing, this is work, this is daily, this is like, if I've had to work it and exercise it every day of my life, so can you, like we all have the ability to do it. Um, uh, there is one word that I like for people to use or to like try to build a deep intimate relationship with, and that's curiosity. Like mm. I'll throw that word out like in the no, y'all don't think that's fascinating? You know, a lot of times I'll be like, I don't think fascinating is the right word. Well, you know, it's fascinating to me that this seems like rocket science to you. It's really mm-hmm. that, that's fascinating to me. Or or that or that in your community, it, it doesn't strike you as fascinating that your neighbor, like, is you know, is willing to vote against their own self interest. That doesn't fascinate you. It doesn't. It's surprising to me the ways in which um, we limit ourselves. And so like, I like to try to remain curious about that. If, if I want to be a part of untangling any of it, I have to like, keep my, keep my beginner's mind, you know, on board. Um, That's the one word that I truly believe in. But outside of that, it's like, eh, you know, so I, I, I want to be careful about the buzzwords because I don't want people to get that false sense of security know that they've got the right language and still don't have, you know, the connective attitude. Um, I wish that we could go deeper on this because that, again, was such a a beautiful answer. But I just want to remind or or let chat know, uh, for anyone who's watching this uh, now, um, Janice Jolie, Lily Lewis, uh, Saul Paul, um, even me, we're all in the chat right now in the chat box. Uh, as we're speaking. So if you have any questions, any follow-up questions, feel free to uh, send that in the chat box and we'll be more than welcome, more than happy to uh, to welcome any questions that you may have or go a little deeper into some of the things that we're mentioning. Um, we're getting close to the end of our session together. I want to go, uh, before we go into the final thoughts, um, I do have one more question that I want to give to uh, Saul Paul. Um, Saul Paul, you focus on um, so much on the energy of the groups that you're in. And I know that in our own unique ways, um, Janice Jolie, I've been a part of your uh, committing to conversation uh, sessions. And so I know that there are some like specific strategies that you use to like sort of maintain a positive energy and make everyone feel connected. Um, But after being uh, in the same room as Saul Paul in New Orleans during the 2020 conference, I remember that there were moments where you would just completely stop everything and just make sure that like one person was still with it and still engaged. Uh, during your experiences with committing to conversation, were there any, uh, what, what, what do you use, what do you, what do you do to make sure that the energy is in the right place? Because this is something you even did before we started this, this panel. Mm-hmm. Um, great question. That's a, um, I would say it was, it's natural, but I've, um, that real hard, I realized the benefit that we have uh, as creatives, as artists, and as musicians. Um, and then I've leaned into that and I take that everywhere I go. It's like doing a show, like I'm not here to perform, I wanna connect with the crowd. So really I think it's rooted in being present and then actually having um, empathy, like really being able to see people. I think that's a big deal. And so I think for some people, like I've coached people before, um, for people have to do whatever they need to do so that they can be present and show up present. Because when you're present, 
then you actually see people, right? Like, like I can literally see, that's why if we're doing a circle, uh, and then I stop and like, no, but like, what are you thinking? Like, like Janice, like, like, what are you thinking right now? Cause I can see, I can see it on your head. I don't know what it is, but I can see it on your brain. And then they'll be like, yeah, boom. But it's only just because I saw that person. Uh, but I'm comfortable. I, I know what it takes for me to be present so that I can see people. So the, 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 the teachable skill is to like do what you need to do so that you can show up present and actually see people and then be present in that moment. Because I believe that's one of the most um, respectful things a person can do is to actually see a person. It's something that I've had to challenge people um, to do throughout the, uh, in 2020, there was a lot of work around all of this work and me being a black male, right? And uh, George Floyd, like we, we share a lot in common, from, like being from the same city, backgrounds, all, all that good stuff. But then, but quickly people will go to like not seeing me and just seeing black men, black in America. Now you don't see me again. Now it's, I'm just part of a, this uh, monolithic group. And so you don't see me. And so even when I'm sharing with you my personal story, they're referring to stats and data and stuff they saw. And it's like, oh, that's disheartening. Like you don't see me. And so one, also I, like, I don't wanna be that. And I love it, thanks for this opportunity to share that because that's something we can all do. No matter how, no matter what we are, cause somebody can say, oh, I'm not naturally that. I know that's why we have to, somebody else could be like, man, like me, I'm, I flow in the moment. Somebody else is like, hey, I need my slides, my deck. I need my stats, my data. We need to be in this order. Cool, that just means you need to do that before you show up so you can be present instead of like be in the moment and do it. It just requires effort. And then it's usually communicated as um, heart because people feel like, wow. Also, I noted before we got on that you spelled my name right. And I, I made a big deal about it. I'm like, wow, you spelled my name right. He's like, oh, no, it's no, no big deal. I'm like, it is a big deal because people spell it wrong. That, that small detail. And I translated it as care and concern. And it's like, it's a tool that people, anybody can do like to be present and to see people. Uh, because it's communicated as care and concern. That's, uh, that's such, all of these answers are just so rich. And I feel like we could go so many different directions with, with all of them. There's just, there's just so much more there that I want to talk about. Um, we're getting a long time, but again, if you're, if you're watching this live, please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, don't be afraid to, to pop that into the chat box. Um, but we're coming towards the end of the pro um, to the end of this chat, and it's been an amazing opportunity to hear about the program. Um, but let's look forward and a little more broadly and talk about calls to action for um, our community at large. So I'm going to just pose the same question to all of you: Where does the, the where does the Folk Alliance community at large and FAI as an organization specifically need to go next? Uh, in what ways would you like to see us move from talking the talk to walking the walk? And uh, and who wants to go first? I'll go. Okay. I think the organization Folk Alliance is doing a lot of things kind of top down, right? And we're inviting the members and kind of the grassroots to be involved in these conversations. So that's the, the leadership I feel like is there. And now what it really is, is for the members and for the grassroots to take responsibility for where they are, right? Start where you are, your folk group, your festival, your board, the people that you already have relationships with, those are the people you're responsible for. And if everyone can take care of their community, you know, then we, we've got all our bases covered, right? So I think it's, but it's moving from guilt um, mm. into action, into responsibility. And uh, knowing that there are so many people in the community that want to do this together, and that, that's, that's what folk music is, is that we come together and we tell stories. So to know that you, there are other people who have your back if you need help and to ask for help when we need it. Because we're all going to make mistakes in this work and that's part of it, right? So yeah, take responsibility. I like that. I love that. Who wants to go next? I, I, I was going to mirror that exactly. So that was going to be my takeaway point. I'll just tag it on here. But um that's my fancy way. That's what be the change means. Like we got reverse stuff going on here. Be the change is like the fact is facts, keyword fact, underlying circle. We all live on the same planet. Can't debate that one. The truth is we each live in our own world. 
and, and true to subjective. So that's where the gray gets and that's when he goes off the rails. But uh, the fact is we all still on the same plan. The truth is we each live in our own world. I encourage everyone to, um, to be the change in the world they live in. So I love what Janet said because yes, Folk Alliance, they're doing their thing top from the top, but it's on us, the members, the constituents to take it and run with it. So it's like in our own world, and we all have a sphere of influence. So many people have the, the mini me mentality, like, well, I, I don't do much. You, you do, you have your own set. You could be inclusive in your set. You could be, you booked, the, you have the, the, the festival, the venue, whatever it is, we all have a sphere of influence. And it's for us to be the change in the sphere of influence that we have and take these tools that we've been used. So uh, given and use those tools. So yeah, everything Janice said, um, and people just need to be the change. And now I'll pass the baton to Lily. I just quickly want to say, I want to remind the Folk Alliance community that we are really a powerful community. Like, first of all, as artists, as creatives, as musicians, and as communities that support artists, creatives, and musicians, um, we are a powerful force. We have changed like the world over and over and over again. Um, so let's let's not forget like that. Let's invest in in like the power that's in that. And the, the only other thing I'll add is that if you find yourself um, kind of internally wanting to be a change agent and uh, picking picking up the you know the uh, challenge uh, that Saul Paul and Janice Joe jo Lee have put before us, um, uh, I would I would encourage you to disengage your fear of what your community will think of you. Um, like I, I, that that did come up quite a few times. Like, you know, you just kind of feel like you're against the wall and you're just kind of scared and you know that everybody will push back. And like, I look at people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg or like John Lewis and like think about all the people who pushed back and like, yeah, the pushback is a given. No big deal. NBD pushback. That's, that's going to be my teacher. And yeah. essential. NBD, the pushback. Okay. Yeah, part of the process, right? Yeah. right? You know? Like first step is they're gonna push back. Yeah. And, so and that's you have to do that. It's fun. You'll be okay. Just do it anyway. And we've got your back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Before we head out, does anyone else have any just final thoughts on the program, on this discussion? Anything at all? Any short final thoughts? Lily, um, so you just heard that we're coming to New Orleans and you proactively reached out, pitched this, and then it all happened. Is that a succinct recap? Well, they had already come to New Orleans. Um, we had our festival here. We had, you know, we had the conference here. Um, and I just, I just loved all the work they were doing. I'm a fan of Folk Alliance too. So I was just like, let's bring this conversation in at the grassroots level. Yeah. Well, let me just share this because I just want to shout out, like, you're the example, like, this is amazing. This program has been great. It created an opportunity. Uh, like it's so profound, but it started with just her being proactive. And I just want other people to see that. Like my final yeah. words are like, let's be like Lily. Like what's your exactly. idea? Fam, if you hear this, what's your idea? Who you right. need to reach out to? It's that simple. And then all of a sudden, like when it makes sense, and so. people like, that's what I would like to say. Like, like, like also add on like George Floyd died, the world reacted. I like to, like, I didn't see anything in 2020 that shocked me, right? I'm like, right. sad, and that's sad. But the point is this, what I did see that was different, though, is that I was like, wow. Like, I don't know why, and it doesn't matter why. I don't get stuck on the why. Like, like people are open to solutions now. Mm -hmm. So it all became, like, if you actually have an answer, not, like, a backstory, not da 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 Like, if you got an answer, like, people are like, cool, let's do it. And I think a great example is what happened with uh, Lily, like, she... She pitched something and it made sense. You know what? That makes sense. Let's do it. And so any and everybody that's listening to this, you can do the same. What's your idea? Who do you need to share it with? And go be the change right now. Any other final thoughts from anyone? I would like to end with the lyrics since, you know, we're musicians, which is, and I would maybe invite Lily to sing us a little something to take us home, but, um, we were talking about, while well, just sing the lyric, it's the power resides where I believe it lives. And I know that the power, it lives in my hands to take responsibility, right? Go do it. It's on you. Lily, will you sing us something? Just a line, just a <laughs> lyric for the people. <laughs> for the people. 
All right, I'm gonna sing you two lines. Two lines, okay? First, oh, let your light shine bright for a moment. Just let your light shine bright for a moment with me, okay? Next, my American heart is alive with the fire in the promise of tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Give thanks. Thank you. Oh, music. I don't know if I how to follow that up, honestly. Um, but folk fam, this has been amazing. For those watching, we hope you have found the ideas presented here as inspiring as I have. Um, and uh, I mean that really personally. Um, a huge thank you to our panelists, Lily, Janice. Uh, and saw Paul, as mentioned before, should you feel inspired to participate in a committing the conversation gathering, there is a link available in the chat that will take you to the statement of intent form. Uh, you just fill that out and uh, we should be able to get you scheduled uh, with, a, with, a, with a session. If you have registered for the continuing the conversation directly following this scheduled panel, please check your email for the link to join that session. Stay safe and connected community and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, for this conversation today. But before we close, before we close, before I, I, I know I've said sort of like the final sentence. I do want to reiterate that we are going, we are still in the chat. And if you'd like to, uh, if you still have questions, feel free to post those there and we'll be, we'll be happy to, uh, to respond to you there. And also I cannot emphasize enough personally how much, um, even as just as a person of color, uh, committing the conversation has seriously led to some really formative moments in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, deeply urge you to be a part of these conversations because um, I have not consistently cried so much and felt so good about it. And it's, it's always so beautiful. So again, stay safe and connected and thanks for joining us uh, for this conversation. Yeah.